Eu descobri por que, que chama PowerPoint, cara, depois de anos e anos usando. Porque se apertar o ponto, ele some, fica com a tela preta. Então quando você está fazendo a apresentação e quer falar, em vez de as pessoas ficarem olhando, é que você pode apertar a tela preta e falar, e você volta. É o ponto, cara. Eu descobri isso um dia, eu estava no meio de uma apresentação, aí eu falei, cara, eu sei que todo mundo vai ficar olhando aqui, mas olha para mim, alguém gritou lá do ponto, falou, ah, aperta o ponto, né? E o ponto foi, PowerPoint, o PowerPoint é. É, <risos> ok. We will invite uh, Osami to show uh, his presentation, and uh, since the second uh, presentation uh, probably will not be showed, we will uh, uh, come to the third one after Osami presentation with Hannah. And uh, thank you. In the okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Osami Kinouchi. Uh, I'm from Ribeirão Preto, USP, um, and this work is has been done with the Ariadne Costa, my former master student, and Mauro Copelli from Federal University of Pernambuco. Uh, okay, I I'm not a young researcher, <laughs> but I I thank you very much for this opportunity. So. Uh, uh, what's the motivation for, for uh, this whole area of research? Uh, in this area, there, there is already a vast literature, okay, on neuronal networks, etc., uh, neuronal avalanches. And what is a, a neuronal avalanche? It's a... Um, uh, when we study... Um, the activity of tissues. It's my... It's possible, it's, it's, it's my cel cellular. <laughs> You're interfering yourself. <laughs> Okay, uh, so the, if you, we measure the activity of uh, uh, neuro, uh, neural tissue, in vivo, in vitro, there are several preparations, okay? Uh, we, we don't observe a Poisson process, okay? But in several instances, we see a more irregular activity. And uh, in, in the limit, we have uh, an avalanche of activity, well separated by a silent, silent interval. Okay? And the avalanche are well separated by silent. And the size of the avalanche is very... Um, uh, variable, okay? So there is a distribution of size. Opa, oh, sorry. Okay, so the distribution of um, avalanche, avalanche size, follows uh, uh, mostly a power law, okay? A power law with this exponent, uh, this is the power law in a log log plot, and uh, this is the curve for, for example, uh, the size of uh, the grid of uh, elect electrodes. So if you grow the, the size, we see that the curve. Um, 
follows to the right. This is the finite size scaling which we see. So this is uh, most. This is a experimental curve. But okay. No, uh, this is, uh, the curves are in the same, okay, in the same, okay, slope. C, uh, is, uh, slope, slope, okay. This curve are, are this parallel with the cutoff, exponential cutoff, this is the exponential cutoff here, okay. Okay. Uh, So uh, in this work, uh, we we study uh, here. Uh, no, uh, we can measure uh, time series, a uh, long time series, mm -hmm. and plot the histogram. It's not necessarily an average. Okay. okay. It's, it's an histogram. Histogram of a long time series. And okay. the cutoff, uh, uh, occurs M uh, always there. Uh, because uh, uh, the cutoff is determined by the size of the the measurement apparatus. Okay. If you grow, if you grow your your grid, electrode grid, you can measure more larger avalanche. So, um, to explain such avalanche, such avalanche dynamics, and this kind of power law avalanche, uh, uh, the most popular, the most uh, developed the approach, theoretical approach, is called the self-organized criticality, as you see. Okay? And the, since the AIDS, uh, back then, Eisenfeld, in, since the AIDS, uh, uh, such models have been studied to describe the av true avalanches, forest fires, Earthquakes, several other systems, physical systems, astronomical systems that have these intermittent avalanche dynamics. Okay? And uh, these models are classified in, in three kinds. Uh, there is models which are called conservative models. There is an conserved property, such energy, etc. And they, they present true, true self-organized criticality. The system really is sit in the critical point with the power law properties, etc. Uh, there is no conservative models, uh, models for earthquakes, for forest fires, etc., that uh, initially was talked as SOC SOC models, but in true, uh, they are not true uh, SOC models. Uh, it, uh, here is the critical point. Uh, here are models that are not critical. Any, any change in a parameter, uh, the, the system is not critical. But there is systems that there's a region here that appears critical, but it's. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. Um, I I would need a transparency. A transparency. Um, well, uh, critical is in the sense of. Uh, there is a point in a phase transition between two behaviors. The most uh, studied, the most uh, common is uh, uh, P 
pique pick a, um, a magnet from your geladeira. Freeze. Oi? Refrigerator. From your refrigerator, ok? Uh, uh, put in... in Close to the, the, the fogão. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's also, there's also, also uh, words I don't know, okay, in the, in the, in the everyday life. <laughs> uh, after some time, if the temperature grows, uh, the magnet loses its spontaneous magnetism. So there is a phase where he has, it, it, it is magnet and the phase it is not and exactly there is a point uh, a specific temperature uh, the critical temperature that uh, uh, it is in the middle and uh, this point has a uh, several properties like uh, power law behavior in several uh, quantities okay uh, there are fractals behavior, there is some avalanches in some sense in this there point. There is a huge literature that pretends that the brain works in critical, in the critical point. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. There is, a, there, is a, there is a book, at least a book, and the Congress, etc. Okay. And there is, more recently, uh, also, a specific model, neural model, neural network model that incorporates a, a mechanism for depressing synapses. The idea is, with depressing synapse, the system tunes to the critical critical point. The, uh, these authors claimed that that yes, in nature physics uh, zero seven, okay. But uh, this, these people here show, show that this is not the case, okay? It is, is they call this quasi-critically, because the system hovers around the critical point, but n n never settles exactly in the critical point as the system grows. So, okay. Our model is basically is also has uh, is non-conservative uh, is a probabilistic automata. I will show you uh, the graph is a random graph basically, but the uh, the system has the proper that he is uh, it is conservative on average, so it's more like the true stock models. I will show you because the fluctuations vanish when when the system grows. Okay. I will not uh, discuss the 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 the, 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 question, the equations, the definition, etc. I I will show only what is the automata. Uh, zero is the resting state of the neuron. Uh, on is the spike. Two, three, etc are the refractory period, period, okay? Neuron Y is coupled with K, K neighbors, okay? K, K like 10, okay? Order one, K like 10 neighbors, and there is couplings. The synapses are, are simply uh, probabilities of if it, this neuron fires, what's the probability that its neighbor fires? The synapses are the this is probability numbers. Okay? Uh, you, you can sum all these probabilities. This is the sum. The sum of the probabilities. Uh, this gives, uh, on average, a, f a firing neuron how much neighbors, in average, are, are ex ex excited in the next time step, okay? So you can define a control parameter, the, the, the branching 
process uh, this probability in average, average over all the network is here. Uh, the branching array two of the process. The, uh, the order parameter, how we characterize the system is the density of the act active sites. Okay? And uh, we started to do calculation, mean field calculations, because the system, handle neighbors, the a network of handle neighbors is well described by the approach which is called the mean field, mean field equations. So there's a problem here. Okay. During the, during this calculation, uh, we found the the transition, the phase. Is, this is the phase transition. Supercritical means that signals does not propagate uh, the uh, on the network. There there is exponential decay of the activity in the supercritical region. In the supercritical region, the uh, um, the activity spreads and grows exponentially, and the, the system has a stationary density of acti spontaneous activity. Here, is, there is spontaneous activity. And this, with sigma equal, equal to 1, is the critical point between this kind of behavior and this kind of behavior. In this kind, in average, a neuron gives, excites another neuron in average. Sorry? I, I miss a sample. Uh, no problem. Here? Here? Sorry? The, 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 the neurons, no. Mostly they fire uh, because neighbors excite, excite, uh, excite them, okay? There is a, an avalanche. After the avalanche, when all uh, neurons are not firing, after the avalanche, we put a single input to start a new avalanche. Yeah, how do you interpret that from? Uh, oh. Ah, sorry. Sorry. Uh, if, if the avalanche occurs in the critical point, in the supercritical region, oh, sorry. In the supercritical region, uh, Ho is Ho is uh, uh, larger than than zero. This question is not uh, no. Here. Ah, here. Here is deterministic. Here is deterministic. One, two, here is deterministic, okay? Here, to, to have a spike, we need a stimulus. Or a external stimulus, or a Negibur stimulus. There, there, is, there is external stimulus, there is negative internal stimulus. The internal is given when you when cell I fires, then gives the stimulus with priority point one to cell one. Exactly, the cell one has uh, this probability to, to fire. Okay, so five minutes. Oh. Okay, I. I uh, Okay, 
the model, the formal model from Levina in nature physics incor incorporates a dynamics uh, for depressing synapses when, when a neuron fires. Okay? The neuron fires. So, uh, its synapses are used in some sense. So, uh, the efficiency of those synapses are diminished by a factor U. Okay? Uh, uh, perhaps uh, it lost some vesicles, okay, in the synapses, so it's more, more less efficient. And this is a recovery, recovery time, a recovery toward this value. What is J I G? Is J is, is the, the 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 synaptic in the Levina model is the synaptic coupling, okay. In your case, the coupling is P I G. But this, this equation are similar. Uh, in our model is discrete time, okay? But in your model don't have the synaptic modification. No, you have it the same, the same, the same kind, okay? This factor is similar to this. This factor is similar to this. The same letters are used when when they, they, they are the same quantity, okay? So. The point is, uh, if we start uh, the network, we, we, okay. this is the synaptic dynamics, okay? The, the, the synapse grows because it is recovering, but if the neuron fires, there is a, a, a loss and the recovery is lost. This is the, the dynamics of synapses. Uh, we studied the handle neighbors and milled, okay, for... I, I will uh, skip this, this main field theory, but the important thing is that we can obtain exact equations for the density the stationary branching ratio in this model with the dynamic synapse. This is the these equations. Uh, okay. And the important result is that the stationary branching ratio of the network, which depends on the synapse, and the synapses are, are moving, okay? But there is a stationary state with the stationary branching ratio. And the difference from the critical value, which is on, depends uh, on a factor that depends on the size of the natural N. So for larger N, which is natural for network, for neuronal networks, large N, on million, on, okay? This factor is zero, almost zero. So the, the system really sits on the critical point. This is a, a, an example, okay? We start with networks with, with different initial conditions for the synapse. But the dyna synaptic dynamics leads the system to the critical point. The synapse self-organizes to the criticality, criticality. Okay? What is represented in the vertical axis? The, the, the global branching ratio. Okay. The network global branch, branching ratio. Okay? And this is time. This is self-organizing. This process is the self-organizing process. Uh, okay, okay, okay. The difference b between our model and the previous Levina model is that uh, the, si the system there <coughs> hovers around a critical point. <coughs> they grow the, the network, but the, the, the distribution, this quantity is similar to our branching ratio. And 
uh, there is no convergence. Uh, the the variance is is fixed. Ooh, okay, but here uh, in our model there is a convergence to a delta function. Uh, okay, I skip. <laughs> Uh, okay. Three trans transparents I, I can use. The problem is this. Uh, so this is the true uh, graphics for the true uh, conservative models and for our model simulation theory etc okay for our model he it, it, it is not conservative in in small sense but in average in the stationary state it is conservative okay uh, this work has been accepted for publication Here, journal statistical mechanics. It's already accepted. Accepted. What what you are uh, thinking in, uh, during the neuromat workshop? Okay, we find that the distribution of interspike intervals uh, show parallels and not exponential. Laws. Okay, and this is from what kind of data? Uh, there are several regions of of the brain. Okay, in, examined in, the, in this paper. Okay, sorry. Exactly. No, no. Exactly. Uh, constructed from from for a given neuron. Okay. And uh, so we found we found data from Lesio here. Okay, started here a collaboration because he showed he showed me that it's neur uh, he he measured neurons that have parallel tails. Okay, another way of. Uh, Sorry, there's some problem. Okay, there. It's another way of of see this tail. If the sending order of easy of with the sizes, the rank of the the size is the easy, and the, if the tail was exponential, the, it would be a. I strike, I strike line here, but no, for larger ev event, events, there is a parallel deviation here. Cortex thalamus. So, thank you. Uh, visit you in Pinguim Ribeirão, for it. I think I, I don't know if uh, we can follow with one question or is the better way to one question, uh, uh, a fast question, then we sure. can. Um, I knew I read your paper. I forgot, but I knew. And uh, when, I, when I read it, I, it occurred to me that um, it's very close to the model I developed with, with Eva. So we think we should discuss to yeah, see yeah. what kind of phenomena. I think we can, we can pick your formalism, your model, etc. Yeah. And, and, for example, put the synaptic dynamics. Yes. For example, to see what occurs. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, so, but, but, my, uh, uh, but I don't understand the following. In our model, when we consider the, the, the law of successive 
spiking points for a single neuron in an ocean of neurons using Eudoschrenyi critical process. So we see that there is an, uh, they are, uh, the correlation decays uh, exponentially fast with uh, the size of, of n. So that's okay. That is Goldberg result. I, we did see what was the distribution. So maybe that's an interesting question because probably you can do it and get a theoretical result for this model for the critical case. So I, I'll try. Um, I want you to thanks to Zami. And uh, uh, following the presentations, I will invite Hene that we will talk about Effect of spike time independent plasticity on functional connectivity on global and global activity of neocortical network models. And, uh, okay, uh, thank you. So, okay, uh, my name is Enan Shimora. Uh, I am a master's degree student. So I'm working with Professor Hawk on, on the, my project, uh, the effect of synaptic plasticity on functional connectivity and global activity of a cortical network model. So we are working on, on a, a network based on the, the cortical, uh, on the, the, this area of the, the, the brain. So a brief introduction, just to remember that we can can divide the, the new cortex uh, in six layers. So this is a, just an illustration. So if you take the, uh, this small piece of the brain, we can see these six layers. And each layer, we have different numbers of neurons and different kinds of uh, morphology of neurons. But we, we just con consider in our model the electrophysiological response of each neuron. So it's not so... Uh, realistic as the the Julian model, but we, we we maintain the electrophysiological class of the neurons. So just general background about uh, as I'm uh, working with plasticity, the synaptic plasticity is believed to underlie learning, memory, and uh, as well a neural recovery after and stroke and other brain damage or disease. In other words, we can. We have some studies that if it, we have a, a, a lesion, a focal lesion, the, the new cortex, the synaptic plasticity can be the, the responsible to, to re reorganize the activity of this, re this small region of the brain. So we will try to see in the future that. But for now, and another information, the long-term plasticity can persist for a scale of seconds or hours or, or more, and we... I'm working with the STDP, synaptic, time, synaptic dependent of time of, of spikes, and this uh, can be a long-term uh, potentiation or long-term um, depression. depression. Yeah. So the, the main goals here is to study the effect of synaptic plasticity rules on the behavior of neuron spike neuron activity patterns on, in a new cortical network model. So basically, until now, we are trying to see what the, this mechanism in our network, what this mechanism will be done in the, the network, what the, will change in the activity of the network. And to study these changes in the functional connectivity, and this fun functional connectivity is based on the, the activity of the, the network, as disclosed by graph theory measures, like taking the, the, the functional connectivity and make some measures like the, the clustering coefficient and the path length just to, to characterize it, what changes with the edge of the, the, the plasticity rule. So for the methods, I'll talk about the, the three important steps to con construct the, the, the network. It's about the structure of the network, what is the, the neuro for us, what is the model of the neuro, and the, the rule of syn synapses. For the network, we base on the, the, this article of Potions, we base it and follows the, the, he divided in four, 
in four layers, we mix the layer two and, and three. And the layer one, we, have, we don't have so much neurons, so we just consider in, in this model, but we can consider it as a background or something like that. And just to show that we rescale the, the network for 4,000 neurons, but we maintain the, the ratio between the excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. So it's, in, it's a layer. You have different probability of connections between the neurons in the same layer and the uh, inhibitory to inhibitory neurons, inhibitory to excitatory, and goes on. And we have different probabilities of connections between two different layers, too. So we have a, a lot of different probabilities of connections. So just to be based on the, an, uh, a realistic neocortical network. So this is just to, to show you how is the uh, GGS metrics. So the, here we have the presynaptic neurons, the index of the presynaptic neurons, and the postsynaptic neurons. Each black dot is excitatory connection. What is the excitatory connection? It's between a, a presynaptic is an excitatory neuron, and the postsynaptic can be an excitatory neuron or an inhibitory neuron. This is an excitatory connection. And the same idea for the inhibitory connections. So the red ones is inhibitory connections. Here uh, is it divided by the layers. This organ is grouped by the layers. So the uh, excitatory neurons from layer 2, 3, inhibitory, and, and goes on. So we have the structure of the structure of the network. And now we have the what is the elements of our network? The, what is the, our neurons? Our neurons respond to these two different equations that calculate the potential, the V this potential, and depends of the this I. This, uh, a current can be an external current or a, a current coming from the another neurons, the synaptic current. And with this model, just to, to show that only change the, the four parameters here, A, B, and C, and D, we have different class, an physiological class uh, that we can see in the, this region of the brain, the new, in the new cortex. As, the, for example, for the excitatory neurons, the most of the excitatory neurons respond as a regular spiking, that we call regular spiking. So this is a, if I put a, a, a constant current in the model here, we can see this behavior. And with the same current, if you take the low threshold spiking, this is a, a, a inhibitory neuron. And we can see this, the, the, the behavior is different, it's a little different. And for the fast spiking, we have a, a, a similar with the regular but with a, a higher frequency. And I, I'm, I'm working with these three kinds of uh, electrophysiological class because it is most ab abundant in this region of the, the brain. So why I think it is important to consider these this three kinds of electrophysiological classes. Sorry, in the second case, B is negative, that's what we mean. In the second case, B is a constant. Is it negative in the second case? Um, I don't remember the exactly value of the B. So the first one yes. is, is excitatory, the second one is inhibitory. Is inhibitory. So I guess no, no, it, just, uh, uh, it has to do with the A and B. Mm. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the idea of inhibitory and excitatory is about the connections in the synapses. Yes, but but in here. The is the Why do you put it? In the synapses, the in the equation for the synapses. Which is not yeah, yeah. We enter in the the the, cor the current. Yeah. If I have a, a inhibitory connection, the current will be negative. negative. Ah, yes, okay. yes. That's, it's just the the idea. Sorry. Okay. And and how do you put? Uh, I, I I can't see how I appears in the in the phi equation changes the variable. Where does the I the appears? The 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 I here. Yes. When you change the variables, how do you get the I? I will, I will show you in the, the synapses because, yeah, I calculate with the synapses with the conduct, conductance coming from another neurons. So I will enter in this eye here. I can. This third category is also inhibitory. And yes, these two, two categories here is inhibitory. It's presented in, in inhibitory neurons in the new cortex. But you mean that this behavior only occurs in this model with inhibitory uh, synapses? 
You need to turn. Yeah, isolating. You just take a iso isolate Nero and put a, a, a constant current in here. So I put a, a, a square current yeah. just to see what's the behavior of the uh, isolated Nero. So I'm I'm talking about the, the structure of the network, the neurons, and now I will connect the, the neurons and you enter in the eye, this eye here. So now I, I, I will show the, the eye. This is the, as I, I, I told you, I can be an external current, like the square current, or it can be a, a synaptic current coming from the other neurons that are connected to this neuron. And if the, the neuron is an inhibitor, the presynaptic is an inhibitor, so we will change this parameter that uh, river the potential, the, like the nearest potential of the have a different values to inhibitory and, and excitatory that makes it uh, po positive or negative. And what we will change here will be the, the conductance, this GC, the conductance. And this, uh, the model of the conductance, uh, 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 a basic model is based, uh, based of um, event-based model. So if the presynaptic like that, the one, is a presynaptic, it spikes, fires a spike, so this value of the G will go to the, the refresh G sin plus G max. This G max, the constant value, if I don't, if I, I'm not uh, uh, putting any synaptic elasticity, this value will be constant. So you'll be like that. So the, if you press synaptic spikes, the G comes to here, and decays exponentially. If this, uh, another spikes coming out, so take another G max. But when I put the, the STDP rule, the synaptic plasticity rule, this G max will change. And uh, this is the model coming from the song, the, uh, uh, a basic model. And uh, to explain better, for example, this is red, the, this green, Bards are uh, presynaptic and this the another the postsynaptic. If the, the if the presynaptic spikes before the postsynaptic, we will have uh, on the this G max you have a strengthening on this G max. So I will put the in a, a, a higher value than before. So if the the same idea, but the the postsynaptic spikes before the the the, the presynaptic, so you have a a, a weakening. Here is just to to show the because it depends on the the difference of time of pre and post synaptic. So the, the difference of time, if it this is larger, is is bigger. So the the strengthening or the weakening it will be smaller. So if I, we are here, for example, it's just to to give an idea of the this difference of time. So if the difference time is is smaller, so the the strain, the delta G here, just the max will be be higher. So this is the the basic idea of the, this model. And for the simulations, the protocols that we use until now, to the these preliminary results that I will show, we use a, a, a duration of the simulation of 10 seconds. And with the input, it's not a, a, a like an external input; it's just a Simulate, uh, uh, for example, inputs coming from from, uh, from the the telomic area or the background. But the idea is just to to activate the the network because for now you, you just want to see. I, I have a network without plasticity and with plasticity. What will change now? Just to to begin to to start to understand what the the, the synaptic plasticity will change. And for the electrophysiological class use for the excitatory neurons, as I, I said, the regular spike in the inhibitor or uh, LTS, low threshold, or fast spike. Until now, I just, uh, I will show. Until now, I just make these combinations only uh, regular spike and only fast spike. Only regular spike for excitatory, only, and the same here with the LTS. And one network without synaptic plasticity and another with synaptic plasticity, but only in the excitatory synapse because the model that I'm using now is for the excitatory synapse. For the future, I use the for the inhibitor, but it's another model. 
And just two measures, just to give my, uh, us one, one idea of the change, just to, to represent here, the clustering coefficient and a synchronous index based on the, the, the variance, the variance of the total activity of the network, and that the variance of total activity for each neuron and a, 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 a mean of the, that. And for the cluster coefficient, the, 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 a metric based on the, the number of triangles complete. Um, for example, if I take a one node here, I have three possibility of triangles that can be formed. But in fact, just uh, no triangles are really formed. So the coefficient is zero. So if I have, for example, three possibilities and two real triangles formed, so we have a, a cluster coefficient two by, divided by three. Yes. So this is a simple idea. And some preliminary results until now. For them, I don't know if uh, we can see, but this is a, a network, this is a raster plot with the index of the neurons and the time. And it's divided by layers, so each color is one layer. And we, this is the, with the case of regular spiking, fast spiking without synaptic plasticity, and the, the case with STDP. We can see here that, uh, in order, we can't see here, and, no, uh, a cons considerable change because if you take the, the mean frequency of the activity of the network, basically don't change. And the. Yeah, it's not too good to see here, but the. Yeah, because the, the, the activity that we ex expect for the new cortex, uh, Rodrigo, Rodrigo will show you that uh, it's a irregular and a uh, mean frequency in like the one hertz, hertz. So you can see, but here is a raster plot for two first seconds and for the two last seconds, just to see in the same network if it's, this, if it's changed. And we basically the same. And if you take the the a GIST matrix of function connectors based on the taking windows of time and counting how many neurons fire together to construct that and binarize the, the, this measure. We can see here and take the, the cluster coefficient, the number of groups formed is basically the same too. So this, this is amount of change. But now what is interesting here, if you take the, the case with the regular spiking, low threshold spiking, now we can see a changeable, uh, 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 a change that is, is, clear here, is clear now. Here in this case, without synaptic plasticity, the activity uh, will probably will die until, I don't know if I, I run for a long time. But when I, I put the synaptic plasticity, in this case, the, the network, the activity of the network became more synchronous and the frequency became higher. So this is a, a thing that is important to consider with the, the electrophysiological class. So the, what we we see here, and the same idea here with the, the functional connect, connections. And now you can see a a, a change, a, a, a higher change here. As you can see that the cluster coefficient is higher here in this case. So for now, it's the, some preliminary results. The, the logical next step is to... How do you define your graph? Uh, by correlation? Correlation? How do you define the, 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 the this graph? graph? Yes, the graph is a graph is a functional graph. Yes. So how you do? You took two neurons and you see if it's a spike, is a, is a, is a correlation, peak correlation between the spike and activity. Yeah, yeah for, for example, just to... If I, 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 divided this time in, in, in windows. Yes. So I take one window and see how many, what neurons fires in the, this window. So I, f I say, oh, this, the neuron two, three, 50 are connected. So I... I uh, because they fire together. Yes, it's yes, just a, a simple idea for, for now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just it. So okay, this is uh, the, some preliminary results. The next logical step is to mix the, the two inhibitory neurons because we have the, the mixed. But we see that we have difference 
we can see the uh, even without specific input patterns, without uh, 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 specific current, just to see the, the, the plasticity, even without this, this that we made those changes in the functional connectivity of the network, with impact in, uh, obviously in the global activity. And the network composition in terms of electrophysiological class of the neuron has influence on the global activity. So that was we think it is important to to see this electrophysiological class in the activity of the this region of the the brain. So it's just some partial conclusions, and for the next steps and in future studies, we uh, to characterize better the, this this matrix, you know, topological matrix and functional matrix, see some relation, and to add STDP in, on an inhibitory synapses and study effect in the this neocortical architecture, and for the future, to induce lesions, that's the, uh, uh, the the future goal, to induce lesions in the network and study the effect of synaptic plasticity in, in their reorganization of the activity. So, oh, this, is, this is it. Okay, thank you, Renan. I think we have time for questions. And uh, maybe... Yes. So one is with plasticity and the other with no plasticity. Could you say in words, why do you believe this occurs? Probably because... Yeah, this is, this graph is from the the case uh, regular spike in low threshold. We uh, think that low threshold spike in this kind of electrical physiological class, doing the, in the, the the activity of the network, a strange behavior that is uh, synchronized the network. So if we have a, a more synchrony activity, the functional connectivity will be will be. Um, but, yes, but it oscillates. Yes. Can you see the oscillation there? It oscillates. Oh, okay. Yes, it yes. Oscillates. So, uh, for, uh, you, the graph you have, uh, you have lots of connections and then nothing. Lots yeah. of connections and then nothing. And you can't yeah, see yeah. this. Uh, uh, I was talking, you said, because in the graph, uh, you just consider the, the, the moments that uh, are connections. So, I put it, I sum one. Uh, some one to disconnection. We have two neuron one and three. So if the spikes together, one. So don't spike. So it's a very, it's a yeah, very, yeah, it's, it's a, a very yeah. partial view. Yeah, yeah, because if partial. you put a one or zero and then you make the average, probably you have yes, something which yes. not so beautiful. Yeah. You have something which um, yeah, half yeah, of yeah. the time you have a connection, half the time don't have. A, we need to uh, probably need to consider some uh, negative. Uh, or so I, I, I would say it's not a good idea to use yeah, a yeah. C to describe this because your graph is changing. Okay. C is great when you have just one graph. Yes. If you have a time evolution, C is not a good idea. So I think you should think about uh, another way of describing time evolution. So you have a time evolution taking yes. values in the set of graphs. And all these things is uh, Olaf Spawn define uh, is for... Uh, a single graph, and so okay. it's not. Um, I think we should think about other ways to ex to express ah, this okay, effect the, on the time evolution. Yeah, what we have to is uh, the some hist histograms about the because we work in the STDP, so it's changing in the conductance. We have some histograms uh, in in time to see the changes in the the conduct is because I don't put here but we have another ways and we need a, a, another another ways to think about what is a good measure here uh, well, we have a, a I think the uh, last question and then uh, we will have a 10 minute interval then we can talk okay okay uh, in this figure okay okay uh, how you, you define frequency because there is oscillations there's a high frequency. No, it's, in, it's in just a, 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 like, and 
is the average, okay? Yeah, like the, the yeah, it's not the average. But the average, average is, does, yeah, does like not the, represent... The, average, the partial, so just to give an idea, it's not a, a, a final or a good uh, measure just to see the, the, the change, but it's just uh, the average. I don't take, it, for example, uh, just the, the, the average for this, these last seconds or... I take the, the all simulation and take the average. It's not the, a, a good measure, but just to see the change, because in this case, uh, the change is clearly. But mm -hmm. just some partial measures. But this is the average frequency of all network until all the time of the simulation. Not... Okay. So uh, I needed some measures to, to characterize better the, 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 the results. Oh, thank you, Hannah, and uh, we'll make a fast break, 10 minutes, just to organize the last two presentations. E following our program, uh, we start uh, the second part of uh, the presentations, and uh, we have uh, made a, a change here, we change... Uh, Thais, the presentation of Thais Filippo that uh, is not here yet, but is arriving, with uh, Thais Terranova. Then we change the presentation 22 and 21 in the program. Thais and Thais. Uh, it's a small change. <laughs> we can consider that a small change. <laughs> but uh, uh, first we will uh, invite uh, Rodrigo to show us the presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, good. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Rodrigo. I'm PhD candidate and under supervision of Professor Antonio Hawk. And I would like to thank for the opportunity of giving this short talk at the first Neuromath workshop for young researchers. Uh, and I will talk about a critical microcircuit module uh, to study structure activity relationships. So, uh, just to give um, a glimpse of the cortex, um, well, if we look in a vertical view from the upper part to the bottom part, you will see that the cortex is divided uh, into layers, where in each of these layers we have. Uh, different connections, uh, different densities of neurons, uh, and also uh, different uh, neuronal variability. And when I say neuronal variability, I not only mean morphology, like uh, pyramidal neurons, basket, and so on and so forth, but I also mean that the neurons fire differently. Uh, they are divided in what we call electrophysiological patterns. For example, these three uh, here are excitatory patterns. You see regular spiking, intrinsically bursting, shattering, and the other two are inhibitory uh, patterns uh, because they, they inhibit their postsynaptic neurons. We have fast, uh, fast spiking and low threshold spiking neurons. Uh, also, uh, the cortex presents uh, many different uh, neuronal activities and and I am particularly interested in the self-sustaining activity, SSA, which is a type of activity that the cortex uh, displays when he is not receiving stimuli. Uh, the subject, uh, uh, he is not um, uh, uh, making any task, he is just uh, uh, in resting, so to say. And in this SSA, uh, the, the cortex shows is low and high amplitude amplitude network oscillations, I uh, would say below one hertz, uh, the neurons fire with a very low firing rate. And if we, we see the distribution of this uh, firing rate, you see that there's a non-Gaussian uh, distribution. Um, yeah. A firing rate distribution because if you if you put the the, the, the firing rate you see that uh, this kind of uh, distribution the, the spontaneous firing rate uh, 
also another key point is that they fire uh, irregularly. Uh, the, the, if, if you plot, for example, the IZ distributions, the, uh, they will show this uh, irregularity on the firing, firing distributions. Uh, we also have other patterns, for example, uh, anesthetized uh, cortex, it shows this up and down states and, and so on and so forth. But I'm quite interested in the SSA regimes. Uh, so people have been working on this. They have been classifying new uh, spiking patterns. The, the knowledge about the cortical structure is also being improved. And with that, uh, different, uh, we have different hypotheses to explain how cortex works, how is the cortical dynamics. Uh, so I would say that despite of these growing data sets, uh, the relation between the cortical activity electrophysiological classes and the cortical structure is not very well understood. It still, it demands uh, some work and that's why we think that a model that can reproduce this, this pattern, these cortical signatures and this cortical activity uh, is quite important and that's uh, the motivation we, we follow. So. What we do, uh, we use computer simulations to model the cortex. Uh, starting with the, the neurons, uh, we use the Isaac cavity neurons. My colleague Renan talked a little about it. It's basically a two, uh, two, uh, system with two couple differential equations. Uh, and when you integrate these equations in computers, you can uh, tune this, these equations to reproduce spiking patterns, uh, any of those five patterns, for example, I can reproduce uh, them by uh, just changing some parameters. So I model these neurons and I couple them with a synaptic rule. We, uh, for instance, use this, uh, we call it event-driven synaptic rule. Uh, basically, when there is a presynaptic spike, you inject uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential at the postsynaptic uh, neuron. Uh, there is a jump in the postsynaptic neuron, neuron. You can, of course, change the size of the jump based on the conductance, and this jump will decay exponentially following this uh, this uh, differential equation. Uh, so, having the model of the neurons and the model of the synapses, uh, we use a integrated connectivity map. Yeah, from uh, this is a very recent uh, integrated connective map. It was done in 2014 by Potsdam and Dismann. Uh, they basically uh, give me a table of uh, uh, what they call connection probability. I, in this uh, uh, full-scale one millimeter square microsecret of the cortex, I know what is the probability of a connection between. Uh, excitatory population in layer 6, for example, with uh, inhibitory population in layer 4 and all the others. So I can use this connection probability with uh, my model or any other model with a synaptic uh, model as well and model a uh, circuit of the cortex. And in my case, we, in our case, we start with uh, uh, modeling 4,000 neurons we divided them uh, in 80% excitatory, 20% inhibitory, which is the ratio of the cortex. Uh, then we divided these neurons into the layers, and then we connect these neurons for following the uh, his table of connectivity. Uh, so uh, taking on the table, what's the probability of connection between layer 2-3 to layer 2-3i, for example, and I, I connected them with this probability. Uh, we also include some spatial location. Uh, we made a calculation that uh, from the upper part of the cortex to the bottom part, uh, there is a 10 millisecond delay. So we divide this delay, uh, we insert this delay proportionally into the location. So the, the cells indeed have some uh, spatial locations, so to say. Uh, in our case, we we consider two different scenarios of stimulation. The first scenario, what we call scenario A, uh, is uh, we try to reproduce an in vivo situation 
where there are cortical cortical connections and thalamic connections. Each one of them has a a, a rate, 8 hertz and 15 hertz. But in the case of thalamic connections, they only go uh, to layer 4 and layer 6. Uh, they are the main uh, input of the cortex. Uh, we also consider another scenario where we perform a deafferentation. So what we do, we basically turn off the thalamic input and keep the, the background input. Uh, this is a common experimental uh, set, uh, the affrontation. Uh, the measurements are, are uh, quite well known in literature. For this case, we, we extract spike in trains, membrane voltages, individual and mean population frequencies, the IZ distributions, CVs, and uh, a synchrony measurement. Uh, which is normalized between 0 and 1, where 0 is uh, total asynchronous behavior and 1 is asynchronous. Uh, as a first result, um, we what we were looking for were for those um, cortical signatures. So we are looking for a collective low spiking frequency below 1 hertz, we also look for irregularity on the individual neuronal spikes, the synchronous activity, large sub-threshold uh, uh, fluctuations. So um, to, to find these this, uh, signatures, we have to perform a tuning of the network. And we do that by, by uh, uh, changing the, the conductance, the excitatory conductance, and the inhibitor conduction. We change the balance between them. So we look on the on a, a very huge grid of uh, combinations of excitatory and inhibitory conductance. Basically here we have 200 different combinations. We perform simulations on each one of these combinations of one second. And for each of these, we change uh, the seeds of the uh, uh, wiring uh, of the wiring probabilities that we perform 30 different seeds for each combination. So uh, these are some uh, some of the results. The results, for example, this first uh, colored plot here uh, shows the average frequency of the network inside the, the, the one uh, second. Uh, you can see that uh, going from this uh, red to black region on the bottom right part of the, the plot, I have a um, uh, behavior that is below one hertz, which is the behavior I'm looking for. Uh, so this is the region of interest here. Uh, this other color plot here uh, shows the CV of the IZ of the neurons. It's, it's basically a uh, irregularity, a quantity of irregularity of the, the network. So uh, the region I'm interested is this green region here, which is uh, close to unit. So you see, you can see that it matches the same region uh, as the, the, the average frequency. This other measurement here is the uh, synchrony measurement. So we, we didn't have much trouble with it, but uh, you can see that the same region shows a, a, a synchronous behavior. Uh, if you go uh, very synchronous to asynchronous behavior. Uh, so what happens if we pick a network inside this region? Uh, we see, uh, for example, GX4 and 15, which is that, that dot on the other plots. So here we have a raster plot of this, this network. Each of these color is a different layer. Uh, it's quite interesting, for example, the box plot of the frequencies of the individual neurons uh, for, because uh, we know that in literature the, the inhibitory layers, they spike uh, much more than the, uh, in a higher frequency than the excitatory layers, and that's what we observe it. Also, that the uh, first layer, layer 2, 3, and excitatory and the layer six excitatory are the layers that uh, should spike at the lowest frequency. And that's uh, an experimental agreement that we observe in, inside this region. Uh, the, yellow and, the yellow and red plots are the 
irregular uh, measurements or irregular distributions, the IZ distributions and the CV distributions. Uh, basically, they, they show us that uh, the neurons are really spiking irregularly. Uh, for example, this last plot here is a, a sample neuron, a sample membrane voltage that I extracted from the raster plot. It's neuron 1840, 840 uh, from layer 4. Uh, you can see some of these features inside this, this uh, neuron in a 10 seconds simulation. So it, 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 the sub-threshold membrane fluctuations are high. It's a, a cortical signature. You can see that there are few spikes. They, it is spiking in a very low frequency. It is irregular as well. It, you, you will also, I, I, I couldn't predict when it's going to happen, the next spike. So it is uh, uh, features that, uh, that uh, cortical signatures that we are looking for and we found on this region of parameters. When we, uh, Turn off the thalamic input. We observed uh, that the activity uh, it fought abruptly, uh, and this is uh, we we have to perform some more uh, studies on that. But we we think that it's quite similar to uh, what they call up and down states, which is a, um, a special state when the, the the when the individual is under anesthesia. It basically shows. Uh, two preferable sub-threshold uh, uh, states. So, for example, this sample neuron uh, that I extract from the raster plot, you can see that after uh, you turn off the thalamic input, the uh, sub-threshold membrane uh, fluctuations, uh, they, they are very low. And if you plot the, the histogram out of this membrane voltage, you can see uh, that there are exactly to uh, preferable sub-threshold uh, states. So uh, to summarize, basically, uh, we are building a, a microcircuit of the model. We want it to show realistic behavior. We want it to reproduce not one only one behavior, but others like up and down and not only self-sustaining activity. Uh, it, it is in a certain agreement with experimental recordings, we have varied uh, a huge parameter space uh, to find the the correct uh, the correct uh, the, the agreement with experimental recordings. Uh, we are using the model right now to study some structure relationships, and we we came here to Neuromat to to find some cooperations and see uh, if. They, they can use our model or we can change it, include another neural model, for example, but uh, that's the idea, basically. So uh, thank you very much if you have any questions. Thank you. 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 And you, you said that uh, in the model you use the uh, excitatory and inhibitory neurons uh, in a totally aleatory contingency also of occurrence in the layers. That's true. Um, when it, when you here, oh, sorry. In the building the model, divide them proportionally into layers. Then, uh, yeah. Also, in um, that there is a correct distribution of the excitatory um, proportions of neurons into the layers. For example, I know that layer five has um, a lower number of a lower size than layer two, three. So. We, we have to perform this division proportionally, not only the excitatory and inhibitory ah, okay. ratio. Okay, I understand. Okay. Ask a question from this slide. How, uh, you mentioned that uh, these uh, probability distributions were taken from another article. How did they define these uh, uh, the numbers? And um, 
which uh, would be the cortical region you are referring to? Do you is is it the sensory cortex because you know that the layers are different? Yeah, yeah. So? No, the, actually, it is from a striata cortex. It's the the visual cortex. But uh, what they do in this paper, they call it um, integrative connective map because they um, they take out uh, data from from lots of other data. Uh, they see where they converge and see what are the diversions. Uh, there are many experiments, not not only one. So it's it's a convergence of other data and other experiments. Both, both. I would say both. Yeah, so far it's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, oh, very nice presentation. Um, uh, I think it's clear um, that we need the to put the students from Sao Paulo and students from Ribeirão Preto in the following question. So we have a, a mathematical model which has nice mathematical properties and uh, you have, we have conditions on the graph of interactions which are mathematical conditions. Uh, not the best possible, the one which you could prove the results. So it's a challenge to consider this, this kind of distribution of uh, neurons with the proportion of uh, excitatory inhibitory synapses uh, and neurons and this structure and to see if we can do something putting this information in the gal in the the model we are suggesting to see if we can do something so if, obvious, obviously we cannot expect to do mathematics if we put too many specific details but maybe a few Details could be used as, uh, connect, uh, concerning the proportion of um, uh, inhibitory and excitatory neurons and something about the structure, the, London, the graph structure. Maybe this, this is an obvious challenge. You should try to do it. Yeah. Just to complement, yeah, this is probably what, um, this is my suggestion as well. I mean, to start uh, using this column, because this is a microcircle. This could be just a a model of one of the areas that Karina presented in the expansion. When she expanded, instead of using an erdos reni uh, model, one could use that one and use the uh, Galvez and Lorcheba model just to model the two, type, two types of neurons, excitatory and inhibitory neurons, without any, any other specificity to them. And then run the model. Yeah. 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 By the way, there is a rest to Pablo, a obvious challenge in our model. The condition you have uh, is a condition uh, for the existence is a ridiculous condition because we consider the absolute value and do not take advantage of the balance between inhibition and excitation. So uh, this is a difficulty that we should uh, consider in this model. So I, I, I'm aware of the fact that once we put more details, we will have to face this difficulty. We are not using the balance. We are considering the Bruchin's condition on the absolute value of the synaptic weights, which is for, for existence and uniqueness. And actually, we don't want to have uniqueness. We'd like to have more than one, one phase. Uniqueness is because we only know how to make perfect simulation in the uniqueness case. But you know to do it in a non-uniqueness case when you use the, your clan of ancestors for the loss network. Maybe we can think about that yeah. <laughs> and discuss but more. You know, I have <laughs> several goals in this meeting. Yeah. One of the goals is to put some of my best friends. <laughs> in this and uh, thank you for your great presentation. And uh, uh, we will invite now Thais Terranova to show 
his presentation here. Uh, you help here. Okay, now uh, start the or last presentation for this session, and uh, Thais will show. Good morning, uh, my name is Thais, and I will talk about the dependence between clinical assessment and the variables associated with a robot device. Uh, here we have some data about stroke, and uh, our focus is the loss of upper limb motor function, uh, because we have 45% of all stroke survivors and contributes subst substantially stroke-related disability. I'm sorry because of the, the English, it's very difficult for me. And there are some rehabilitation treatments, actually, uh, especially focuses on improvement of upper limb motor function. Then it is important to define a systematic practice of evaluation of these treatments to better, better understand the recovery function of upper limb in stroke patients. And we have in the lit literature uh, several upper limb assessment instruments. In this review, Kim, uh, we, have, uh, we found 47 different assessment tools showed significant heterogeneity in choosing these instruments in uh, 126 researches. However, it is observed that there is no standardization in the use of these instruments in clinical research in stroke patients. Therefore, there is need for an objective assessment tool that contributes to a reliable uh, assessment of the effect of interventions. Robotic devices have been used as tools to access limitation functional. In this study, our goal is to verify the dependence between variables obtained by the robotic device and the, the results of Wolf motor function tests. It's a tool that we use in the clinical practice in order to improve the eff effectiveness of assessment method currently used in upper limb post stroke patients. Uh, Wolf motor function test is a tool that has that have uh, tasks aiming to evaluate the function, including shoulder to the, f to the fingers movement, and ordered by level of difficulty using one or multiple joint motions. And, and this evaluates the task execution speed in time in seconds. Uh, the Wolf motor function test uh, must be filmed from a camera placed in standard position. Now, after the, the uh, uh, the administration of the test, we have to analyze the videos about the, these tests. The score of the tasks is given based on the anal analysis of the videos. That the results are reliable, the evaluator must perform the reading of the manual as well as use the specific materials. According to previous studies, the speed measure that the comple complexion of the tasks has high, he high reliability in both direct measure and the score about the videos. On the other hand, we have the, the difficult about this 
Wolf Motor Function Test. Length of test, it's up to 30 to 40 minutes, and then more than 30 minutes for scoring. And the floor and ceiling effect is very poor. It consists uh, about the uh, robotic measurement. It consists of a series of visually guided and visually evoked unconstrained written and the circle drawing movements and attempt to move against the resistance. Stroke patients can complete this, uh, this assessment in 30 minutes. Uh, about the reaching text, tasks metrics include Deviation from a straight line, aim, average speed, peak speed, and duration of the movement while attempting to reach toward different targets, and smoothness of movement. Here you have a short video Can you about the tasks, the reaching tasks, where the patient uh, needs to reach all the targets around the, the circle. Yes, and this is a good patient with mild incapability of the upper limb. Change the speed? Of the, test? the speed? No, is uh, only the uh, patient's movements, not the the uh, dispositive. Yes. Uh, in circle drawing task, uh, we need, uh, we go to capture the coordination of army movements and measure the strength of the, the shoulder uh, and then uh, ability to move against resistance or to hold against an externally applied force. Another video about the circle drawing, drawing that we can measure in the coordination of the movements. Because the, the people, yes, the person uh, ah, moved, the, moved. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> phone problems. <laughs> 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 Occupational the, therapists don't have very <laughs> good coordination. It's very common. <laughs> 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 This is the report, the uh, robot report, uh, and we can see these results uh, in the reaching tasks, circle drawing, and uh, against the resistance. This is a very good patient yeah. result, but uh, the, the, these people, uh, this person, can execute the, the Wolf motor function in very uh, short time, only five sec seconds, but the coordination is very, uh, very uh, bad. bad, yes, damaged. And this is the, the uh, graphs about the force, shoulder uh, strength. Oops, foi um monte. Well, now about the statistical analysis. Our hypothesis is. Uh, is uh, analyze these this, uh, variables, variables, pairs of variables, and to test the dependence of all, uh, all of them. I'm sorry, what is X and Y? Uh, is the variables, is only the hypothesis. And yeah. then. So, so you, you have things which has to do with the strengths and things with, with coordination. One is X, the other is Y. No, uh, for, for uh, ah, all okay, this, all yes. This. All these pairs of variables we used the the test, the but independence the test. One is the dependence versus w, MF, what is independence? Uh, independence is a measurement uh, robot do about the robot. Is a when the the patient do the does the the circle, they measure the coordination. If we don't have a parameter in like meters or another it uh, only is, is the value that you yes here independence 
is to how uh, in continuous is the circle. Is the, the co in coordination provided by the robot? Is a robot who, which provides it? Yes, yes. All of this is automatically provided by the robot. Yes, the patient is good, and then the robot show these results. And we we know how the robot computes it. <laughs> no, it's a very secret <laughs> information. We don't know all the, how the robot computes it. They it, don't provide. The robot does not uh, uh, has a documentation explaining how it computes independently. No, only this we can access in the the dispositive, the device. Only this information about the patient. Why did you choose this parameter? Because you could have chosen smoothness, for instance. Did you? Because of the the test we use it to to analyze the statistical test is only to uh, continuous variables, and is the uh, only few uh, parameters have the continuous, are continuous. And then uh, about these continuous variables, we choose these, these parameters. And then testing the dependence. Uh, first, with conventional tests in literature, uh, all of them. Least test based on the, on the size of the longest increasing subsequence of the random permutation, and this finally compares uh, to compare the, the results of these tests. Uh, in the first pair, we have the independence uh, versus Wolf motor function test, and then we uh, don't found don't don't found uh, didn't found f find correlation, uh, linear correlation, only non-linear, uh, but we uh, found dependence that has been tested and captured only the, the, the least, the least test, test, least test. Uh, experiment candle and the others showed no significance, then the independence is rejected in favor, in favor of dependence between the two variables. Uh, unilateral dependence, smaller wolf time values are more dependent on values taken by independence. In the second, shoulder abduction in Newton versus uh, wolf motor function test is the same, similar uh, than other, but there are dependence that has been testing in and captured by the test. Sperman, Kendall, Hoffman, Genesis, and the list. Dependence is rejected in favor of dependence. In the third, uh, sh uh, shoulder flexion in Newton 2 and the Wolf motor function test. And we found the dependence uh, tested and captured by Genesis and the list. Independence is re rejected in favor of dependence, and the unilateral dependence with a smaller wolf time values are more dependent on values taken by sh shoulder flex. Uh, and the, the last one, smoothness and wolf. In this case, the, all the tests don't project, don't reject the, the, the independence in favor of the dependence. Then uh, we found a non-linear correlation with groups present in, in all of the, the graphs. Least tests show a dependence between uh, these three pairs variables. In these results, we observe the unilateral dependence if both time values grows dependence between the both variables is less marked. And then, although Wolf motor function test is one of the most reliable and sensitive instruments to assessment of per limb function, uh, it has limitations due to poor fluor and ceiling effects. Robotic device can evidence upper limb functional limitations even in smaller volumes in Wolf motor function test. It, this, this result supports our report that robotic measures will be more efficient to capture the changes in stroke patient's function. And then, I'm sorry, uh, it's a pleasure for me, it's here in this, in this meeting, and thank you very much. Thank you.
And uh, we have time for questions. And uh, I have a, a question. You you show that some of the relations are not linear, All and uh, that uh, sometimes we, when we think in clinics aspects of the data, it's common that you make uh, assumptions only considering two parameters in a general way. Something like uh, is uh, the area involved in the stroke is related to the, the disability, the motor disability. That not uh, describe if the relation is linear or it's, or it's not linear. And uh, the presupposition, if you think uh, in a general way, you can presuppose that's a linear relation. And, uh, and uh, in a lot of moments, the, if you use this assumption that's linear, it could be a problem because if you use the different uh, uh, classes of the lesion, in my example, you can find a, a strong correlation or you can find an even not a correlation. And that yes. could be a serious problem because you can find in the literature a lot of works that shows how you, you can find the correlation or we cannot find the correlation. And then how you are thinking about this in, the, in your data and uh, how can you contribute to this kind of the, the beta? Uh, our... Uh, we have uh, only 41 patients in this study. And then uh, because of this, we, uh, in all of the, the uh, papers in literature, we have uh, a lot of patients, uh, uh, more than 100, 200, and the, the correlation is more uh, easier than in, in uh, smaller uh, populations and uh, another question is about uh, in the graphs we have some concentration in this uh, short smaller wolf time values we have a uh, population specific in this case is only uh, a straight population. I don't know. I, okay. It's difficult for me to, to <laughs> Okay, okay, we can talk. Uh, I don't know if we have other questions. Oh. Uh, we have a short break now. We, uh, for this kind of graph, for this kind of graph with very clumped data, Yes. perhaps if you put a log log plot you can see better the correlation the, the correlation and if you have power law correlation and also uh, the indiv individual points mm. okay okay putting a log log, log uh, graph log graph thank you I have another question here Thank you. Um, I'm not really a specialist of this part of uh, science, but I want to know, is there any possibility to build a relationship between uh, the independency and war of time? Um, I ask that because there is some, sometimes we have nonlinear data, but we can build a relation like the Lorentz systems, uh, to, to, that can help to explain what happened. I don't know. But also, perhaps we can use the information coming from the dispositive you use. And because there is, a, if it is a, a robot, that, that means that there is uh, many of um, captors to use to determine the position of the movement. You see, that is just electronics, but I think perhaps they can, it can be possible to have mathematical models can, can help to explain that things. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if we have another question. If we don't have, maybe we can go to uh, make this short break and then we start with uh, our 
what's the name of uh, that's not a round table and uh, is the yeah okay uh, thank you Thais and now we will start our tutorial about uh, open science and NAS and uh, it's our pleasure to receive Professor Fabio Kuhn. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about open science in the context of the Neuromat project. So my name is Fabio. I'm a professor of computer science, and I'm involved with the Open Source Competence Center at IMI. And we consider um, to be a partner of the Neuromatch project. And um, one of the key principles of Neuromat since the beginning, when Galvez started to talk to, to people, was that we wanted to generate science that would be as open and as widely accessible as possible to the entire society and produce results that could be available to all researchers. And he was talking about this in a period in which several institutions around the world were uh, with the same idea, with the same philosophy. And in recent years, uh, the term open science started to be uh, more used. And the idea of open science, so it refers to the idea that publicly funded research should be accessible to all and should benefit the entire society. And when we talk about open science, normally we are referring to three things. First, open access publications. So it's a different model of publications in which you publish in a journal and your paper is freely available everywhere in the world. Uh, to publish in the, in, normally in a journal, a journal has a cost and to cover this cost, Every journal has a way of doing that. In open access, either an um, institution, for example, a society, pays the cost, or uh, the authors pays a publication fee. In the closed model, uh, it's free to publish normally. Not all, in all of them, but in most of them, it's free to publish. And then uh, the libraries pay a lot of money to, to have the 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 papers available. I remember at IMI, 10 years ago, we paid about 1 million reais per year in subscriptions of journals. Now it's probably more than that. Maybe we pay, uh, I'm just guessing, maybe we pay 2 million reais in journal publications, and I, I don't think this is a good idea. I'm against paying 2 million reais per year. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's reasonable. Uh, this model would be much more interesting, I think. Um, the second pillar is open data. The idea is that the results, the data that you collect in your experiments, you should make them freely available so other people can uh, first verify if you did the right thing, re re verify in your results, and maybe do other kinds of analysis on top of the data that you obtained and get other insights for new experiments. And um, nowadays, a lot of the research that is being done, the analysis of the data is made with software. Uh, so the third pillar is to have this software as the tools that you use to analyze the data are as open source software, as free software available to all. And in my opinion, this is the, the only way to do reproducible research, which is um, a main fundamental concept of research, of science, right? Um, so I think that open science is the only way to assure reproducibility of scientific results. Uh, in traditional closed science, people do an experiment, collect the data, do some analysis, and then publish a paper. And don't share the data, don't share the results, and you must believe. Uh, you must religiously, religiously believe that the person is saying the truth, and that result will be, uh, could be reproduced. Um, this doesn't sound very scientific to me. I think the only way that we should work in the future is sharing the data, sharing the tools that we use to analyze the data, sharing the process, 
sharing all the pipeline that we use to to get to our conclusion. So anyone in the world could download the experimental package and run again and see if you are telling the truth or not. Verify. Unfortunately, most of the research we see nowadays is not verifiable. Who is supporting this open science? A lot of people, for example, uh, the European Commission, it, uh, it started to talk about uh, open science in the times of the framework FP7, the, the previous program. Now in Horizon 2020, uh, they recommend, now they mandate that, and it's, it's not a mandatory, but it's uh, uh, open, access, open access publication is mandatory and open data is uh, highly recommended. And the idea is that in the next one, it will be mandatory. Uh, FAPESP has, in, in several of these calls, this idea also. In, for example, we had a call on e-science in FAPESP, and there it said that the results should be accessible under an open source license, and in the case of software, or under a Creative Commons license, in the case of documentation, technical reports, and associated documents. These considerations also apply to databases, data sets, workflows, etc., generated by the project. And several, uh, the National Science Foundation in the United States is also uh, promoting that. So we believe that this is the future. In, oh, <laughs> I, I was timing and I forgot to, to, to press start. So let's, okay, I'll control the time there. Um, let me talk a little bit more about the software. So a lot of you will be analyzing data using software, using code. And uh, what we mean by open source software or free software, these are synonyms, the same thing. Um, you must have first uh, four freedoms. The free, uh, you publish your software, and anyone sh should be able to download the software and ha have these four freedoms to use the software to study the software and see the source code and see how it works, wh which methods you used, to modify, to adapt to their own needs, and uh, should be free also to redistribute the software with their modifications. So if you follow these four rules, then you have open source software. If you don't, then it's not open source. Don't call it open source if you don't allow these or if you don't allow this, then it's not open source. Can be available source, but not open source. Uh, the, the easiest way to do that is to choose one existing license. There are many existing licenses, open source licenses for in, with different flavors, allowing different kinds of things. Some of them allow commercial use, some don't, some allow some kinds of modifications. So uh, you should pick an existing license and um, and tag your code show it explicitly in the root of the source code that you are using the licensing it under this license and put in the web page of the project that we use this license. If you don't choose a license, then it's not free software, it's not open source. If you simply put this source code on the web, it's not open source. Then uh, what happens is that the copyright law of the country uh, is the one that dictates what happens with the code. And in Brazil, in the U.S., and in Europe, the copyright comp uh, uh, copyright law says that you cannot do anything without asking the author of the code. So you cannot use it, you cannot redistribute, you cannot modify it without asking permission for the author. This is the default. So if you want to be open, then you must choose a license and publish your code with that license. Uh, I'll skip this because we don't have much time. But I can leave the slides. This explains the kinds of licenses. Uh, this is a work, workflow to choose, depending on what you want to do the software, what kind of licenses is more appropriate for you. But we also can help you if you if you have a specific piece of software. You can enter in this in the site chooseallicense.com. <laughs> it will help you to choose an open source license. But you can ask us, and we will help you to do that also if you have some software and you want to make it open source. So the benefits of 
making your software open source, the knowledge will belong to the entire society. Uh, students, developers, researchers will be able to learn from existing code. Uh, there are uh, studies that show that if you, your code is open and many, a lot of people use and program with it, then you have improved privacy and security because more people will be uh, looking at the code and fixing the bugs and closing the, the gaps in the, the holes. And uh, you can share the costs. You have better use of resources. Instead of each science, scientific group reinventing the wheel and re-implementing the same theme again and again, if we share, we can go further with less effort. There are also benefits for the economy. This is not the main focus here, so skip this. <laughs> there are also many successful companies uh, that are based on open source software, and this is also not the, the focus here. Uh, my recommendation, a lot of people say, okay, I'm working on a software, I want to open it, but it's not time yet. And the day will come in which I will receive a illumination from the sky and then I will open my code. Or when it's ready, then I will open the code and then it never gets ready. Three years ago, uh, three years later, we are saying the same thing. So don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. You should... I tell my students, you sh when you write the first line of code, then you should make it open source, and then you continue the second line and open uh, in an open source way. This is the, the philosophy. Because the longer a project is run in a closed source way, the harder it will be to open it later. And normally, if you take a long time, it ne you, nev you never open. Because a lot of things happen to make it more difficult to, to open it later. So don't open it later. Open it today or yesterday, if you can. Go back in time. Um, and there in the Floss Competence Center, we have a lot of experience on on licenses, on uh, opening the code, uh, and then on creating communities around what are the best practice for nurturing a good open source community. There's a very nice book uh, about this. The second edition is coming soon, so we can also help with that if you, if you want. We have this... Competence Center, this is the web portal in which we promote uh, research and education in open source, and we help other research groups and sometimes even public and private companies to, to do things the open source way. Uh, there's also an international network of competence centers in which we collaborate with them. And that's uh, so, okay, so this, is, well, this was open source software and talk about open publications and now open data. So the idea of open data, again, is sharing the data among the scientists. Uh, again, th there's that principle of not reinventing the wheel. If someone did an experiment and sometimes it's very expensive to do an experiment, you make that data available so more people can also do uh, research on top of that. And then you can decrease costs. Uh, maybe you can collaborate with others and everybody share the data. You will uh, amortize the cost of doing the, producing your data. Uh, also, you are doing a good for society because you, here we are using public money to do research, so we should make the, pub, the data public also. Uh, is a way to promote collaboration among research groups and to accelerate research. But opening data is not easy. Uh, s maybe software is easier because the software already has a structure, already has a compiler that understands the software, and data it doesn't have. So you must provide the metadata that will uh, allow anyone to work with that data, and this metadata should explain what's the structure of the data. Uh, he repeats metadata. So we should have standards to... Uh, represent this metadata. Sometimes this is standard exists and then we should use, sometimes it doesn't exist and we should try to, uh, in agreement with other researchers, propose a new standard format. Uh, we should provide the tools to manipulate that data in that specific format. We must take care of privacy. If we are dealing, for example, with data from human subjects, then we must be sure that everything is anonymized and, and following the ethical concerns. If we are, again, uh, dealing with patient, patient data, our databases must 
uh, have a good security level, not to allow someone to, to steal the data and figure out private, for private information, for example. And we should have good query and navigation mechanisms to process this data. And then uh, Kelly will talk a little bit more about this uh, databases and the data part. And just remember what we promised in FAPESP, in the FAPESP application of Neuromat. We said that the first activity of the center in technology transfer uh, will be the development of a collection of open source tools for basic neuroscience research, database handling, and clinical practice, in particular with respect to diagnostics and rehabilitation of stroke patients. This will evolve in tandem with the theory of up to point, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So, uh, Kelly is working on this database together uh, with Claudia on the data from clinical practice. So we are we are doing this, but we should that do that in all the aspects of the project, not only in this aspect. So, uh, just to cite, I have a a paper in this website talking about open science. If you are interested in the topic, and this is the the website of the Floss Competence Center. So thank you now. Kelly will continue the talk with the open data part. So hello, my name is Kelly, <laughs> and I'm a professor of the Department of Computer Science. As Fabio said, I'm working in, uh, in Neuromat uh, in the database development, and not only this, but also in the uh, other software uh, that we uh, started to create now. Um, but as Fabio said, Neuromat is, uh, is committed with the production of uh, open data or uh, free software so just to summarize this, uh, we have two kinds of software that you want to produce in this project. We have the data management software and the data analysis software. Both, are there, uh, both of them will be uh, made available as free software. And we have also, uh, here I put databases in the plural, and I will explain why. But part of these databases will be uh, opened uh, in a near future, I hope. <laughs> um, but how we can do this? How we produce uh, um, free software? How we produce open data? Uh, before discussing that, uh, I think we need a, a more um, specific definition of what is an open data. Uh, first, open data is more than a publicly available data. As Fabio said, uh, an open data must have an, must be understandable. We have uh, we must have um, descriptions of the structure of the data. We must uh, we must have a, a data with high quality information about their provenance. Uh, what is provenance of uh, uh, data, of data, is how, uh, when, where, by who the data was generated. We must know the context of the, uh, the data to uh, really uh, know how to use, how to reuse this data, how to redistribute. Um, so according to the definition of Open Knowledge Foundation, open means anyone can freely access, use, modify, and share for any purpose, subject at most to requirements that preserve provenance and openness. So if I put my data uh, publicly, but I restrict their use, this is not open data. If I, if I say that the data cannot be use it commercially. This is not open data also. This is strange, but it's, uh, uh, this is how the, <laughs> the definition uh, was said. Um, but if you are not convinced that uh, produce open data is important, uh, I will provide more, 
motivations at this moment. Uh, some scientific publishers started to condition article publish publication to the uh, public release of the data that uh, was used as the basis to generate the results. Uh, examples of this, PLOS One, Biomed Central, these two uh, publishers conditioned the publication of the article to the uh, release of data. Uh, as Fabio said, the, the new calls of uh, the new call for projects of FAPESP already uh, states that we need to make uh, the data and the software produced uh, in the project, uh, not all, some of them, as open data and free open soft source software. Well, I think. Uh, it's easy to understand the benefits of this, the possibility of validation and reproduction of the results, and uh, we can produce science of better quality and greater impact. But we can consider uh, this as also as a civic Dutch. Since the uh, most part of the research that is made in the world is funded by public money, it is expected that we can uh, facilitate the access to the results for the uh, other community. Um, in the United Kingdom, uh, we have two uh, kinds of acts that guarantee to every citizen the right to access uh, the informations, informations that is held uh, by public and local institutions and this includes universities and other organizations that make uh, research. Um, and we have something uh, related to this here in Brazil also. G uh, we have a decree that is known, uh, is known here like, uh, as Lei de Acesso à Informação that uh, says that governs says that all people have the, the right to access all the information that is produced by uh, federal organizations and governmental uh, agencies. This includes also the uh, universities and funding agencies like CAPS and C and PQ. At this moment, this decree are being used more to govern transparency. But I hope that in a near future we can uh, involve the, more the universities uh, in this task of publishing their data, the, the data of their research projects also. But if you, uh, we want to create a scientific open database, uh, what uh, we need to do uh, from the legal perspective? Only recently, the licenses that were uh, conceived to uh, free software or to uh, free content started to be adapted to be used with databases. Um, we have two kinds of uh, licenses that we can use to uh, protect. It does not protect the right term, but uh, to, uh, uh, we can apply with database. And uh, when we say database, we have two types of things included in the package. The structure of the database and the content of the database. And the licenses must cover these two uh, components. Uh, we have the, uh, one, uh, the licenses of Creative Commons, and the licenses of the, the new version of the licenses of Creative Commons uh, are read, uh, can be already applied to databases, and they cover both uh, structure and content of the database. And we have other kind of licenses. Uh, that was specifically created 
two databases that are the open data commons. And in this uh, kind of uh, license, we have different licenses, uh, one to cover only the structure and other to cover only the uh, content of the database. Uh, with this license, we can, for example, allow, uh, we can limit the use of the data to those who credit the authors and or providers. We can establish that the data can only be redistributed uh, with the same or an equivalent license that the one that was ori uh, originally used with the, uh, the data. Yes. These are examples of the things that we can uh, establish with the licenses. There are some kinds of licenses that do, do not make this restriction, but we can made, make if you want. Here is just an example. But by the definition of open data, uh, we should not use a, a license that make this restriction. Otherwise, we cannot call the data. But the definition that I, that, that I saw, different places stated exactly that. We cannot restrict the use of data even for commercial purposes. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. no, you, you, you can use for commercial, but cannot hide the, the data. Yes, maybe this is. Yes. Yes. Please, I, I guess that you speak in the microphone only because we have uh, 200 people, uh, person on the uh, watch. <laughs> Watching me. <laughs> Watch you, Kelly. Watch you, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what the uh, other important thing that we must consider that uh, the copyright copyright laws do not apply to uh, all kinds of database. In fact, we have uh, when the database content uh, is purely factual information, or when the structure uh, of the database uh, does not represent an original organization uh, uh, of data, uh, in these kinds, the cop copyright law, uh, laws do not apply. Uh, and if we consider the databases in the domain of biology, uh, in the biological domains, uh, it's really uh, easy to find databases with that characteristics. So uh, th that's something that we, we should uh, consider. Because uh, now there is a lot of projects trying to restrict the access of the data, but uh, in most cases, we have no uh, legal uh, guarantees for, for this data. Um, another point that, as I said before, to really produce open data and to eliminate all the legal barriers to facilitate sharing, maximize the data reuse, uh, what is recommended is that scientific databases should be placed in the public domain. That means waiving all authors and provider rights. In this case, uh, it's really open <laughs> to provide all the possibilities for who uh, wants to use the data. And uh, in fact, we have special licenses to do this, to waive the authors and provider rights. Who wants to know more information about this, about licensing? Uh, 
for databases and uh, how to to uh, produce open data uh, can um, look uh, at these uh, references. We have uh, the, the first one, the Digital Creation Center. It was created to support the researchers in the United Kingdom to. Uh, to control the management, né, uh, uh, the management of their data, um, thinking uh, in how to respect that act uh, that guarantees to every citizen the right to access uh, the, the public, uh, the governmental data, the data uh, of projects that is supported by public money. So. In this, uh, in this curation center, we have a lot of very interesting information that uh, helps in, in thinking about how to, to organize uh, research data. Another reference is uh, we have here are the Open Knowledge Foundation. There is a, also a Brazilian working group dedicated to open science. Uh, and uh, I have, uh, I, I wrote uh, a, a short paper about uh, open data in science. And there I described a little bit about the, the licenses also. But we have some challenges uh, when we think uh, about open data production. The first one is the lack of standards, as Fabio said before, for data representation. Uh, and if you have a lack of standards, there is another reason <laughs> behind this. That is the lack of consensus about what should be stored. So, in some uh, uh, specific uh, biological domains, has, such as uh, bioinformatics, uh, genetics, we have uh, already a lot of partners that uh, guarantee uh, the interoperability of the software that is produced for uh, these domains. We don't have this already in neuroscience. This is one of the, the, the biggest challenges that we have now when we, uh, we uh, manage data of neuroscience uh, subdomains. Another important po um, point is the difficulty uh, uh, of registering data provenance. Data provenance has a lot of different perspectives that we can consider. For example, when you think about experimental data, uh, the experimental data in neuroscience, we have different kinds of data. Uh, EEGs, uh, signals, we have fMRI that are images, we have behavioral data that can be described in very different ways. And, but we have all the provenance of this kind of data is related to the uh, experimental protocol we use it to collect this data, uh, is related to the information of the laboratory or the research group that uh, conducted uh, the experiments, and uh, the information about the patients or the subject that uh, were involved in the experiment. So we have a, a, a lot of uh, information that at the first moment may not be directly involved with the data collected in the experiment, but that can uh, influence the analysis that are made with this data after. Another point is the uh, scientific community's resistance to the idea of open data. Uh, and uh, I understand this resistance uh, due to the fact that collecting data in experiments is difficult and is costly. Even uh, if consider the time, to collect the data, and even if we consider the resources we spend, uh, 
uh, to, to collect this data. Um, and this task of collecting data is um, poorly recognized by peers. So uh, this resistance uh, has uh, a, a reason, but if we consider the benefits that we have when we open the data, I think we, uh, we have a positive balance here. And so this cannot be, uh, this cannot avoid us uh, from producing uh, open data. Another point, uh, how to uh, give the proper attribution to researchers and institutions uh, for the database that they provide how to protect their interests regarding the use of data. This is uh, something that uh, is really difficult to control. And after that, we have the difficulty of data creation. Data creation uh, concerns uh, the necessity of, keep, uh, of keeping data updated as time uh, passes. Um, so it depends on people to do the management, the maintaining of the data, and special equipment to, to store large amount of data and uh, in a safe, secure, uh, with security, um, and things like that. But Claudia <laughs> recently found uh, an interesting. Uh, article uh, about this topic that emphasizes uh, this point about data creation and the necessity that uh, we have to uh, invest more in this because we are losing a lot of the important data. Data that uh, costs so much to be produced. So this is something that we must uh, address uh, now, and uh, well, now considering uh, what we uh, are doing, Neuromat project regarding software development and uh, database modeling, um, I will uh, explain uh, you what we have at this point and, and what you want to do uh, in, uh, as next, ne next steps. Evandro show uh, uh, has shown this uh, picture yesterday, but I will uh, uh, talk about a little bit again. Uh, in Neuromat, we are considering to produce this uh, we say this in computer in computer science we use these words the this architecture uh, of components. But what the uh, it means? We have uh, some software that uh, is being produced to run in the research laboratories that um, we have associated in the project. So we uh, this is. This point uh, in the architecture. Um, what is the function of this software? Is to uh, store the data that is generated in the experiments conducted in the, in the laboratories. This data will uh, um, is maintained stored in local databases. They, they uh, store some informations uh, that may be uh, sensitive, that uh, concerns to uh, patients. So part of this data uh, will not be made publicly available. They will always be kept in the local database. We have also uh, the Neuromat Central Database. This database uh, will be a database that will um, aggregate the data proven provenient of different, the different labs of the project. So the laboratory will define which data can be 
sent to the Neuromart Central Database, and what kind of data that will be sent to Neuromart Central Database? The non-sensitive data, anonymized data, and things like this. And we, uh, and we have here another kind of uh, software that will uh, be responsible for the uh, standardization of the data that is produced in the, uh, in the laboratories, and, and then we'll feed this the, the, the Neuromat database. And the Neuromat database will be uh, accessible by external users that means users that are not members of Neuromat and the Neuromat members also by means of uh, a web portal. In fact, we call this as a science gateway because uh, we expect that this portal will enable users not only to query data, compare uh, experimental data, but also execute some analysis uh, services over the data that uh, are stored in the central repository. So uh, we, uh, we have, this is why I put database there. We have a lot of local databases each laboratory will have your local database, and part of these uh, local databases will be uh, centralized in the Neuromatch database. And at this point, we are developing uh, a software tool to manage local experimental data. I have already said that, but yesterday Antonio Roque asked um, what, how these tools that we are developing, this database, are related to other projects uh, that uh, also produce computational resources for neuroscience area. And I, uh, and I answered that we have really a lot of Pro, big projects that are producing uh, resources for new science, but we have a lot of deficiencies uh, in the database that we uh, we see publicly available uh, now. Let me show you what's the main problem. Here we have a list of neuroscience databases that is available uh, at Wikipedia. Uh, and we see uh, there is a kind of classification of this database, but we, we have that most of them are specific for uh, one type of experiment or fMRI uh, or uh, EEG. Uh, some of them uh, involves only uh, experiments with humans, other with animals. So we don't uh, see here a database that aggregates experiments uh, from different types. And another point we have. Uh, these databases generally have poor quality data. That means inconsistent data, outdated data, incomplete data. Why this is, of course, because in this database we have data that was generated by different uh, research labs uh, and uh, or maybe different projects, and this data uh, was just put together in a big repository uh, without any control uh, over the quality, over the, the complete not completeness, <laughs> it's not a word, but uh, over the quality of the data. Really. And uh, uh, in addition, we have insufficient documentation, lack of metadata, lack of provenance, provenance data. We have uh, overcomplicated access uh, to, to this data. Uh, sometimes we have even to install a specific software to, uh, to reach the data. So this is the, 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 uh, the picture of these uh, computational resources now. And we want to produce something that is more than, than that. 
that really can provide data with a higher level of quality, of consistency. Just to, to exemplify, we have here two articles that address the, these problems that I, that I mentioned in the previous slides. Um, but uh, we have uh, the, the GIS neuroscience databases, but we have other kinds of researches that we can consider uh, um, to help us in this task of creating our database in neuromatch. One uh, of these uh, resources are these guidelines to report experiments. Well, uh, they are documents that uh, were, were, were written by the uh, community, uh, neuroscience community, and they specify which are the minimum information that we must include in, a, in an article, in a paper, when we want to report an experiment in some specific neuroscience uh, subdomains. We have here uh, three examples of guidelines uh, that was that were produced by uh, for neuroscience. The first one is a more generic one regards neuroscience investigates, investigations. The second one is uh, for event-related potential EEG data. And we, we have another one for fMRI ex, uh, studies. I will just show you one of them uh, is the, uh, the mini guideline, the one that is for EEG experiments. And a guideline of the, of the type has this, uh, this kind of information. They state what are the, the fields, the, uh, the structure of the uh, information that we must include uh, to report. In the case of, uh, in, uh, here we have information about the subjects of the study, uh, the tasks, the stimulus, uh, the behavioral event. This is related to the experimental protocol. And uh, here we have the, the information concerning the subjects and so on. We have uh, cons used this as basis to define the structure of the database that we are creating here at Neuromatch. So the, the Neuromatch databases that we are creating, uh, they have this main purposes, to store data in an efficient and secure manner, to support the research activities uh, of the project, and this is uh, one point that we must consider now, that gather high quality information that will be made publicly available in the near future. So before thinking about uh, opening the data, we must collect the data and guarantee uh, an appropriate level of quality. And we've, after that, we can think about opening the data. collect and label and uh, put some uh, structure and uh, all this. Um, in our, the, our uh, database are divided, the structure of our database are divided into uh, main modules. Uh, the first one is the organizational data that collects information about the people, their affiliation, laboratories, projects, uh, team members, work groups, and who are producing the data that we are, uh, the, the data that we are managing. And the, uh, the second model is related to the experimental data by itself. So we have the raw data, the data that uh, are collected in the uh, in EEG experiments, fMRI experiments, and after, the derived data, the data that is produced by means of an analysis process uh, on pipeline, on workflow, uh, and things like that. So in, this, in these two types of data, we must uh, consider also the provenance data, the metadata that are, are necessary to, to describe uh, 
the data and enable uh, their reuse. And uh, what was the approach that we used to uh, develop this database? We gathered the data requirement uh, of one laboratory at a time. So we started with the laboratory of cloud. Uh, and we also consider all the good work already done in other related projects, such as the, uh, the MIBI guidelines, as I said before, and the structure of other open database. Um, but uh, we defined the, the structure of the, the local database, and after that, we must feed the database, put the data inside the database and have other uh, um, some computational tools that enable us to recover the data also. Uh, and this is the uh, the main functionality of the neuroscience experiment systems, uh, NES. That uh, uh, is the software, né, the open source software that we are developing uh, at this moment. In fact, uh, it is already in use. Uh, in Claudia's laboratory, uh, and uh, it is in the uh, in point two version. It is a beta software. That means that it is uh, being tested yet, but it is in use already. Uh, it was tailored to the uh, labs, uh, the Claudia labs needs, but it can be easily adaptable to other research labs. It's, it is available now. Uh, anyone can uh, download uh, its code, can install in, in his laboratory. And he has, it has these modules uh, already implemented. The, a model to record patients uh, registers, uh, we have a model to control ex uh, experimental data, but at this moment we only uh, consider the data about subject groups uh, and the experimental protocols. What we are developing now is uh, the, uh, the functionality to collect the uh, EEG data, uh, TMS uh, experiments and uh, things like that. We have also a, a model to uh, questionnaire administration uh, and the users and access uh, control to keep uh, data uh, in a secure manner. And these are the modules that we uh, want to develop uh, after have a lot of things related to experiments, the reimagining, behavior, data acquisition, uh, subject groups involving non-human animals, and uh, laboratory organizational structure, derived data. And uh, we have other kinds of neuroscience research that we should consider. For example, uh, yesterday Hawk said about the neural models that we could also uh, store in the database. And if you uh, have other suggestions, we, we would like to, to know. And uh, well, in fact, I don't have more time to uh, to, to, the, to continue the presentation. But uh, just to summarize uh, what we have done, uh, we have created uh, at this point a database model to to uh, store the local data produced in experiments conducing in the laboratories of the uh, Neuromatch project. We have uh, started the implementation of a uh, software system that uh, interfaces the access to these local databases and that uh, will help us to feed the Neuromatch central database, I hope, in a new future. And, uh, um, is that if you, uh, anyone is, is interested to see the, 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 the software running, I can show you uh, after I have uh, access to, to it uh, at my machine. And 
if you have any questions. Ah, uh, uh, one last thing that is uh, most important. Uh, I'd like to present to you the team that is involved in the development of the, the software. At this moment, we have uh, only two developers, Evandro and Diogo. Uh, and uh, uh, me and uh, Professor Fabio uh, are involved in the coordination of the development work. We have also Carlos Riba that has not, uh, it uh, helps in the implementation, uh, but it's not full time <laughs> dedicated to this project. And uh, our main collaborators uh, are Professor Claudio and Professor André. Frazão. Uh, and we have, uh, uh, of course, a lot of other peoples that have already worked in the, this development, but uh, unfortunately are not more uh, with uh, us at this moment. So, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, maybe we have time for some questions, not too long because it's lunchtime, but. Uh, Just a comment. Uh, well, congratulations for the effort by you and the team. I'm totally favorable, favorable but to uh, in terms uh, about uh, experimental data sharing. Okay, first of all, I'm totally fav favorable, but I, I kind of understand some of the resistance by resistance by the community. Uh, not only because of time consumption and difficulties, but also some. Um, piece of rationale that maybe should be considered considered by by you and the guys from now on, which is um, exposition of the experimenter, uh, the, of exposition of the experimenter but to health uh, threatening situations, health threatening drugs, and uh, mm -hmm. despite all the safety procedures and chemical hygiene, etc. But you know, uh, risks are there. <laughs> Experimenter, experimenters have this type of Pierre and Mahiki like situation if we exaggerate the rationale. Anyway, I, it's, uh, I, I was wondering, there must be at least someone out there saying, uh, well, I spent, I exposed myself so, for so many years by, to these uh, uh, carcinogens and etc. So there's no way I'm giving, out, giving away my data. I don't know. Maybe this is something to be considering this rationale to, I, don't, I mean, to defend, I mean, defend uh, both uh, chemical hygiene and, therefore, data sharing, ex even experimental data sharing. Okay. Um, the, the first point is um, regarding the, um, the privacy concerns related to patients and uh, this kind of thing. I, I'd like to say that we we have some computational rec uh, resources that we can use to protect the privacy of uh, patients. When I uh, when I show uh, show the uh, structure, uh, the architecture of the the tools that we are developing. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that we uh, we have um, some data that will always be kept only in the uh, laboratory that will n never fit the central neural mass database. This is uh, to protect the privacy of the uh, the subjects involved in the experiment. But uh, we can anon easily anonymize data, so uh, we we. We can preserve the, uh, the sensitive data about the patients in the local database, but send the data related to the experiments uh, and uh, the, the data collected uh, in the experiments to the central database. So uh, we, can, we are able to separate uh, the, the data uh, under different perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, exposition. I, I, I'm not, I was not talking about, for example, patients, mm -hmm. the own experimenter. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, uh, I don't know. For for example, maybe in the future, uh, with a huge experimental database, experimenters will be acknowledged not only by their efforts but also 
of their the the risks mm -hmm. uh, they they expose themselves to. Like, you mean health risks because of drugs and I I, I just uh, mean in terms of not, not the privacy mechanisms, mm -hmm. but as a more overall thought because we we are making these uh, looking forward. Uh, uh, this overall uh, acknowledgement of this kind of situation because part of the resistant res resistance will, will also be due to that, to health risks and maybe uh, the whole community will, will acknowledge that, like making the, uh, th those people, uh, how to say, making it, it, it important. It will be also useful for, for to, to, to even uh, uh, improve uh, safety procedures, for example, mm -hmm. it could be, it could be, uh, it, it, this could uh, add, add these, uh, but this additional piece of utility, you know, usefulness for, for the the global uh, community. Okay. Claudia, do you do you want to comment? Well, um, if I understood uh, correctly, you are saying that uh, the many times the experimenters themselves are exposed to risks, and so they are collecting data in a, in a risky con condition or context, and then um, this should be taken in consideration uh, in terms of uh, making available this. Uh, this this uh, data that uh, is so. So you are suggesting that in the databases, for instance, you should include items that uh, relate to safety procedures, and this is an interesting suggestion. Oh, uh, well. Let me maybe rephrase. Not not only because these will, will make the, the the maybe this could uh, make the difference between an, an, an resistant experimenter, like making making him to well, okay. I I will share my data because my my risks and the risks uh, uh, that my students were exposed to are recognized, and uh, our safety procedures are shared. There there are like global standards anyway. Uh, okay. They they are they are there anyway, but it's it's uh, it doesn't hurt anybody to 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 for to have an additional way of of informing the the newcomers to the the new science newcomers for for them to be aware of these procedures and then for for and also for them to be aware that their risk and their effort will be recognized even though they, their data will be uh, public uh, eventually. Well, the, the question of sharing data is a um, difficult question in the team of Neuromat. In our first meeting, January 2014, I guess, there was a very tough discussion among members, public discussion, about this issue. And I remember uh, Leonardo Cohen, who is a member of our Scientific Advisory Committee, he was there. And then he made a, um, a, a summary of the discussions the last day. And he suggested uh, uh, to us not to, not to fight on this point. I mean, if uh, Claudia wants to share the data of her lab, great. We are doing this. But uh, if um, such a good friend of us member of the team does not want to share his data, okay. Uh, I hope that in the future he will be convinced that it's better to share than not to share. I, I remember I had a very tough discussion by phone with a dear member of the team, important scientist, and, and explained to him another experience. There is um, an open data in linguistics developed by Charlotte Galves, um, who is now, I guess, very famous scientist in the world because of this work. He has, she has been doing this in the last 20 years. And he, he, she, she spends many hours every week 
to build the database. And then I told him, look, uh, Charlotte probably is um, better known today as a developer of the Tycho Brahe corpus than for the papers, good papers she wrote. And he said to me, well, but you cannot make a comparison between making databases in linguistics. Well, you just need to scan to di 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 digitalize a paper. And I was very upset because he, he, this means that he did not understand anything about uh, collecting right text, uh, making the, the electronic um, translation of this, making all the labeling you need to handle the data, make all the open software you need. It's a huge, huge amount of work. It's different than, than get, putting needles in a brain, for sure, but it's very difficult. I was very, very upset. And then Lelquin told us, look, my friends, don't fight for this. This is the future. It will be impossible in a few years to publish a paper without putting all the reference. In the statistics, a journal like uh, Annals of Applied Statistics will not accept a paper if the data is not made available. Will not accept the paper. And we know that uh, a huge proportion of papers, not only in neuroscience, but in science in general, are just fake. They're wrong. They're not telling the truth. So, uh, I guess the fight for having, uh, this is my data, I want, and uh, uh, this is over, my friends. If you want to have uh, public support, you have to be, and it's important to tell you why we, we called the, um, the corpus of historical Portuguese Tico Brahe. Tico Brahe was not a linguist, he was an astronomer. Because this man made, uh, made uh, registered data day after night after night for so many years, and it was so hard. If you go to Wien, where he did it, and you see the weather there, to, to stay outside, because they, they, they need to stay outside, it was terrible. Uh, risky life is, is this, to stay in that Wien. And then, uh, due to this, he got a very bright uh, postdoc fellow named Johannes Kepler. And Kepler was able to find the laws of Kepler because he has uh, read the data. Uh, and this uh, is an ex ex example of us. I hope the Neuromath database will find uh, Johannes Kepler in the near future and then make the theory of the brain that not only Neuromat, but also uh, uh, Walter, uh, Jackson, Freeman want to do. Uh, maybe we can... Uh, sorry. Maybe we can have a last question. And, uh, yeah, yeah, just a last question, and uh, we finish to lunch. Yeah. So I think there is one more challenge uh, for an experimenter to to share the data. <clears throat> I mean, so I have data of, of patch clamp cells, right, that are filled with biocytin, so you can reconstruct the morphology, something similar to what they used yesterday in the talk, right? But I would never share that. And this is not because I don't want someone to use the data I struggle so hard for and do something with it without acknowledging me. It's because it's just not so well organized and it's not so proper, you know. Ah, some cells are like this, some cells are like that. I knew all the details, not anymore, right, but when I did it, right, so I knew kind of what I could legally look at and what I couldn't look at, but I cannot give this data set to someone. First, because it's, I mean, it's dirty, right? I mean, it doesn't look nice. I mean, it's kind of it's my dirty laundry, right? And also, I mean, I, I think it's really extremely hard for someone to actually do something properly with it, right? So, so for me to generate a data set that can be shared properly, I need to generate it with the intention of sharing it. I need to kind of know which properties it needs to have in advance. Yeah, 
And, 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 but I think this is, a, for me, I mean, I have data, but I wouldn't share it. And, and this is not because I'm possessive, right? It's just because I, it doesn't have the standard. But th that is the motivation for the, the, the software tool that we are developing now. This software tool was designed to help uh, scientists to organize, collect, uh, store uh, his or her data in an uh, you know, easy way. Uh, and the NAS system has this purpose. So uh, at the moment that you design it, uh, your uh, experiment will have uh, some functionalities in the system that you can use to describe your experimental protocol. And after that, uh, that we can associate it to this protocol all the data that is collected during the experiment. And uh, we can in the system we have also the functionalities to to um, to keep data about the subjects and the uh, clinical records, uh, health history, uh, social history uh, of the subjects, also um, all the, the the questionnaires. Yeah. Uh, in your case, you should have a, a, a specific place to to describe. Uh, how your uh, your whole methodology, which dye you used, how many micrograms did you inject, uh, you see, so it's a record of your experiment, and you are right, it should be done uh, while you are doing, actually doing your experiment. Uh, okay, and uh, then we can finish to, to lunch. I think we are losing the focus. If I'm not sure, I, I, we are losing the focus on the discussion. <laughs> and uh, maybe we can uh, stop now for lunch and then we return for the... We will have two or three... Oh, in the NUMEC? Okay, we finish here and after lunch we will be in NUMEC. is near here on the crossing the avenue. Okay, oh, I need to finalize the... Okay, that was a pleasure. We have, I think, I don't, I'm not sure if we uh, have uh, yet the 200 uh, viewers, but uh, we had three, uh, 200, more than 200 viewers in your presentation, the Fabio presentation. And uh, I, I'm not sure if you don't have 200 before because we don't look, but... Uh, and uh, then we uh, stop here, and at the end of our presentation uh, in the afternoon, we will have the the, the round table on NUMEC. Okay, thank you. <laughs>